Good day, class. Let's begin our conversation on Chapter 3, Legal Issues and Employee Selection. The Learning Objectives. Understand the legal process involving employment law. Know what classes of people are protected by federal law. Be able to determine the legality of an employment practice. Understand the concept of adverse impact. Understand affirmative action. Know the important issues involving employee privacy rights. So first, let's look at the judicial pecking order. The judicial pecking order. It starts off with the most important U.S. Constitution. The U.S. Constitution and the Fifth and Fourteenth Amendments. The Fifth Amendment focuses on equal protection. The Fourteenth Amendment, state and local governments, that no state can deny equal protection. So you can see where these particular issues of equal protection and when it comes to employment, the Constitution does have some role. Then there are other federal laws as well. We have the CRA or the Civil Rights Act, the ADA, the American Disability Act, ADEA, AIDS Discrimination and Employment Act, FMLA, Family Medical Leave Act, and EPA. EPA Equal Pay Act of 1963, prohibiting discrimination based on sex. We also have executive orders, in particular, Executive Order 11246, focusing on federal contractors. It established requirements for non-discriminatory practices in hiring and employment on the part of U.S. government contractors. We also see the place where decisions are going to be made. When there is some sort of uh, issue regarding employment, some employment practices, we tend to look at it at the federal case level. We have the U.S. Supreme Court being the ultimate interpreter of the Constitution, and then the interpreter of other federal laws, the Circuit Court of Appeals. There are 12 circuits, depending on the region of the country you're in. Virginia and North Carolina is in the fourth circuit of Court of Appeals. And then there's the U.S. District Courts. We also have other factors that play a role as well. The federal administrative guidelines. We have the EEOC, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, and then OFCCP, the Office of Federal Contract Compliance Programs. I should note the following as well. If a law is passed at the federal level, states may pass laws that expand the rights granted in the federal law, but they may not, however, pass laws that will diminish the rights granted in federal legislation. Protected class and federal laws. On the left of this uh, graph here, we have protected class. We see age over 40 is covered by the Age Discrimination and Employment Act. Disability is covered by the Americans with Disabilities Act and the Americans with Disabilities Amendment Act, as well as the Vocational Rehabilitation Act of 1973. Race, national origin, religion are covered by the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the amendments in 1991. Sex is covered by the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and amendments in 1991 as well as the Equal Pay Act of 1963. We also have pregnancy, or pregnancy is covered by the Pregnancy Discrimination Act. Discrimination based on pregnancy. For women affected by pregnancy, childbirth, or related medical conditions shall be treated the same for all employment. They cannot get worse treatment, but they may get better treatment than people with other disabilities. This was also expanded with the Family Medical Leave Act. We then have the Qualified Military Veterans Protected Class. The federal law that covers this is the Vietnam Era Veterans Readjustment Act of 1974 and the Jobs for Veterans Act of 2002. This is the legal process at a quick glance. So at the very top, we see the following. The employee believes unfair treatment has occurred. The employee then can file charge with a regulatory agency. The agency will then investigate. 
This is some of the findings that can occur. One, we can see no unfair practice found, the process ends. On the far right, we can see this, unfair practice found, but agreement w reached with the employer, so they come up with some sort of uh, decision as to what they're going to do, and the employer takes steps to correct the problem. Therefore, the process ends there. Of course, there would be some sort of follow-up by the regulatory agency. So on the far left, we have no unfair practice found, process ends. Then on the far right, an unfair practice has been found. The employer then takes steps to correct the problem because they either agree or decide that it's best to go ahead and take care of this now. Now, what happens if that's not the case? An unfair practice found, an agreement not reached with the employer. The agency takes employer to court. If it involves state law, the case goes before a state district court. A decision is made. If it is appealed, no. If it's not appealed, the process is over. If it is appealed, the case goes on to an appellate court. If the decision is appealed, no, the process is over. But if it's appealed again and they say yes, the case goes on to the Supreme Court and so on and so forth. Now let's look at the other side here. The agency takes the employer to court and it involves a federal law. The case goes before a federal district court. The decision appealed, no process over. If it is appealed, it goes on to the federal appellate court. Is it appealed after that? Process over. If it's not appealed, if it is, it then goes to the Supreme Court. But ultimately, if there is no decision and, I mean, there is a decision, but it keeps getting appealed and appealed, it will ultimately wind up, whether it started in the state or not, it will wind up with the case going to the Supreme Court. Now, why all this about the legal issues and why are we talking about this now? Why is this important? We need to look at the problem scope here, the scope of the problem when it comes to uh, employment practices and people having complaints, sometimes founded complaints, uh, meaning that there was found to be an issue where they said there was one. So let's look at some of the years. Let's look at the latest year here, 2013. There were 93,727 complaints, of which 82% were deemed unwarranted. So nothing was done, meaning that uh, the investigation found nothing to merit, merit for this case. But during that same time, for the remainder of the warranted, the ones who were founded, meaning there was some sort of issue, there were $372 million pay, paid out in monetary benefits. And you can see it sort of adds up and it has been increasing over the years. So organizations or their insurance companies, when they have been found uh, on the wrong side of a court decision or a investigation by a regulatory agency, they will have to pay. Okay, and this is what they're trying to avoid. That is why the HR people have their jobs and industrial organizational psychologists have their particular jobs, is to try to make sure that there's a strong legal foundation for what an organization actually does so that they don't wind up in court and definitely don't wind up having to pay some sort of uh, benefits and sort of monetary compensation for individuals who thought they were wronged. Here are some of the potential legal problems that we have here. We have disparate treatment. This is where we have intentional discrimination. Now, the organization as a whole may not know what is going on, but members of that organization, the representatives of the organization, could be demonstrating disparate treatment where they are intentionally discriminating against individuals. Then we have disparate impact, okay? And this is basically what we refer to as adverse impact. Adverse impact, an employment practice that results in members of a protected class being negatively affected at a higher rate than members of the majority class. Adverse impact is usually determined by the four-fifths rule or the 80% rule. Then we see other potential problems. We have invasion of privacy. Okay, and illegal searches. 
when you're on company grounds, what rights of privacy do you actually have? Can they go into your locker? Can they go into the computer that you use? What are the bounds of the ability of the organization to search you, to, quote, invade your privacy? These are very, very difficult issues at time and ones that have to be considered quite often and wind up in court, for example, because we see organizations will normally think, and rightly so for the most part, that when you're at work, there really isn't and should not be an expectation of privacy. And they should be able to search your, your belongings, quote, belongings at the workplace. But again, these are highly contentious areas and of course are always up to debate. The employee complaint process. Well, first we have an alleged discriminatory act. Usually what that means is that there will then be some sort of internal investigation. And usually the HR personnel involved in this and the supervisors and managers involved in this will take specific note to make sure that they document everything and that they behave as professionally as possible because they realize their notes, everything that they do as a result of investigating this alleged discriminatory act could possibly wind up as part of a uh, case in court. Their notes could be subpoenaed. So this internal investigation is something that they take very, very seriously. There's also potentially being an internal resolution process essentially to have a formal policy okay, in place as to when this happens, these are the steps that take place. It's very important for that to be laid out, usually laid out in some sort of employee manual or handbook. The internal resolution process, here are several options. You could have a decision be dictated. You would have it to be mediated, a solution mediated, or some sort of arbitration go on there. Okay, and then what are going to be the grounds for appealing these procedures as well? That's going to be as important as well. Now, on top of that, we have external resolution process where we have state agencies in deferral states where it goes to a state agency. We have the EEOC or you can have the, the primary external resolution process where it gets to that last resort is going to be a lawsuit. So here are the alternative uh, dispute resolution. We have mediation, where you have a neutral third party uh, make the decision. The disputants reach some sort of agreement. The neutral third party is going to be managing that discussion. Then we have arbitration, a neutral third party, but it is the arbitrator, arbitrator that makes the decision. The decision can be binding, meaning that no one can appeal it. It's just the way it is. They have to agree to it. Or non-binding, where they can uh, get back onto the fight, so to speak. And then we have dictation, where the third party just makes the decision. So these are the ways in which these disputes can be resolved within an organization uh, and sort of outlined. So usually it will be outlined somewhere uh, in the policies and regulations of the organization. The EEOC complaint process. So we have an alleged discriminatory act and the complaint is going to be filed. 180 days for non-deferral states and 300 days for deferral states. The employer needs to be notified within 10 days. When there is an investigation, the goal is to complete that investigation within 120 days. This is what the investigation can find. Reasonable cause found. Then you have that attempt to reach an agreement that was sort of demonstrated in that flow chart that we saw earlier. If no agreement, then the EEOC will file a suit. If reasonable cause not found, the right to sue letter is issued to the employee. Employee has 90 days to file a suit. Now, let's look a bit more deeply into the Civil Rights Act, Title VII. Who is covered? 
Now, we talked about the CRA covering a whole bunch of folks, but let's say who is covered. Let's get into some of the nitty-gritty here. Who is covered? Private employers with at least 15 employees. So what this suggests is if you are a private employer, employer but you do not have 15, at least 15 employees, you're not covered by this. Federal, state, and local governments are covered by it. Employment agencies covered by it. Unions covered by it. Americans working abroad for American companies covered by it. Who is exempt from it? Bona fide tax exempt private clubs. They don't have to follow the Civil Rights Act. Indian tribes don't have to follow it. Individuals denied employment due to national security concerns. If it's not security, we can not have to follow it. And also, publicly elected officials and their personal staff. So if there is a Civil Rights Act violation, a violation of Title VII, what are some of the court-ordered remedies? So if we have disparate impact cases, okay, we have the following. You can have them reinstated, so reinstatement. You can issue them back pay or give them seniority status or front pay. You can also establish affirmative action programs or pay attorney's fees. So there's a variety of things that can be a result of disparate impact. All right. Disparate treatment is a little bit more. Here we're seeing, again, something that may be a little bit more like uh, intentional type of things that may be going on. So this is disparate treatment cases, same as disparate impact plus so you can have all the stuff we see with disparate impact, but you can also have compensatory damages, which will include psychological damage, the actual expenses the person may have incurred, the damages to their reputation, punitive damages for the private sector only. So if you want to punish the company or organization in the private sector, you can. So you can give them punitive damages as well. The damage limits... There are some, but there are no limit for race. I apologize. I noticed that I probably need to make something somewhat clear. What is front pay? You may not have heard of that term before, front pay. Front pay is money awarded for lost compensation that occurs between the time of judgment, for example, at this particular case, and reinstatement. So now let's look at what are the things at issue here. Usually anything involving people's money, they can be very sensitive and be very contentious. So usually anything that has some impact on one's ability to make a living, to have uh, a salary increased or decreased or have a better job, these are things which are very important decisions and a person's work life and life in general. So here are some of the employment decisions which are of critical importance when it comes to legal issues and selection and, and, and employment decisions. We have hiring, placement, promotion, where are you assigned your assignment, salary, what type of discipline you may get, as well as training opportunities. So anything that in these areas have a great deal of impact on what your future is going to hold, whether or not you get hired for the job. Obviously, that's a big deal. Okay, where will you be placed? What position will you be placed in uh, when there's new positions open up, open, opening up in the organization? Do you or do you not get that promotion? Are you assigned to an area or shift that is a money-making one, or are you always on a shift that makes hardly any money? Are your salaries the same as your compadres who are in the same position with the same education? If you did something and someone else did the same thing, is the discipline equatable? Are you going to get that training opportunity that can lead to another promotion, a higher paying gig? 
or not. So all these employment decisions are very vital to one's life and they are we look at them very carefully because they can be areas in which people can face some disparate treatment and be discriminated against. All right, so now let's look at this particular graph and I'll introduce a, a term to you that we'll explore a little bit more a little bit later. Uh, does recruitment directly refer to a member of federally protected class? So we're looking at whether or not a decision is going to be something that uh, will be legal or illegal. All right. Does requirement, the requirement for a particular job, refer to a member of a federal protected class? If no, then has case law, state law, or local law expanded the definition of protected class? If no, does requirement have inverse impact? If no, then we're probably talking about something that is a legal, a, a legal decision, probably legal. If the requirement has adverse impact, is the requirement a subterfuge for discrimination, meaning that it's just a cover for some organization in order to uh, discriminate against people? For example, we, we saw this oftentimes in, in parts of the country uh, uh, decades and decades ago about uh, voting and trying to suppress uh, minority votes by having a, a literacy test or or had to have a be a property owner so those could be just ways that we can subtly get in there and have it be something for discrimination so if there is some sort of subterfuge for discrimination and that's found that's probably going to be illegal if not then the requirement is the requirement job related this is where that job analysis things become so important okay if it is job related and you can say that because of the data that you have and the research you've done were alternative and that's a yes then you have to go to the next question were alternatives with less adverse impact considered yes they were okay so that will probably be a legal uh, a, a very legal decision now let's go up to the top again does requirement directly refer to a member of a federally protected class yes then you have to ask yourself the following is this part of a BFOQ, bona fide occupational qualification? We'll see a little bit more about this later, but what this really comes down to is saying there is a certain uh, quality, a certain characteristic, a certain thing that is required for you to do this job. And if you don't have it, sorry, you can't get the job. So what they're saying here, if this is a BFOQ, if it is a BFOQ, identifies a BFOQ, then it is probably going to be legal. If it's not identified as a BFOQ, then it's probably going to be illegal. All right. So determining whether an employment decision is legal. So does the practice directly refer to a member of a federally protected class? And again, what we mean by a protected class is any group of people for which protected, protective legislation has been passed. A federally protected class is any group of individuals specifically protected by federal law. And so we see some of the individuals that we've already seen in previous slides that are protected, covered by things such as the Civil Rights Act or race or your national origin or the color of your skin, your age, the religion that you may practice, disabilities you may possess, if you are a qualified veteran, or if you are a pregnant female. So these are groups that are deemed to be protected, okay? And legislation exists specifically uh, for them for that purpose. Now normally what this means is and why we have these protections is because there has been some historical discrimination that is known to have existed against people who fall under these characteristics, have these particular, possess these particular traits. Okay, they're, they're of a certain race, of a certain national origin, a certain color or skin tone, uh, religion and so on. So that is why we do have these particular groups protected federally by legislation. So, 
is the requirement a bona fide occupational qualification, the BFOQ? Only members of a particular class can perform the job. That is what it's stated. Only members of a particular class can perform the job. There can be no exceptions. According to the courts, race can never be a BFOQ. Religion has been, for example, a nun or a priest. You must have, for example, a certain religion, the religion of the place that you're working. Gender seldom is a BFOQ. And customer preference doesn't matter. So if customers say, well, I don't want to be served by someone of that type or someone of that color, what have you, that is not covered under the BFOQ. It is not a bona fide occupational qualification. So customer preference doesn't matter. Race can never be a BFOQ. But we have to understand what BFOQ is saying. Certain occupations may be such that it sort of dictates certain individuals of certain types or characteristics that must be there uh, while the person is doing that job. For example, certain individuals who are undercover operators for a federal agency, you would not probably send an Asian American agent or uh, African American agent to uh, infiltrate a white supremacist organization. It makes no sense. But the idea here is that the BFOQ is basically saying the job itself sort of dictates what type of individual has to be someone who fills this position or slot. Now, I know that as part of your assignment, you have the uh, somewhat famous or infamous uh, BFOQ uh, Hooters, and that's what this slide represents here. And so I just want to remind you that is part of your discussion form uh, for this particular uh, uh, chapter to discuss some of the issues. There's a video clip there for when uh, some men in the past have sued Hooters uh, to hire them as waitstaff. Okay, and so the Hooters organization had to fight this and basically say why it is they believe that gender is a BFOQ for their particular employees. As I stated earlier, state laws can add to but cannot take away from federal laws. So local, state, or case law added protected classes. Well, state laws examples we have here. Virginia protects marital status. Wisconsin protects sexual orientation. 17 states ban gender identity bias. Local law examples. Cincinnati protects people of Appalachian heritage. Santa Cruz, California outlaws discrimination based on height and physical appearance. And case law examples. Former drug use is not a disability. So obviously these things are things that may have popped up in law cases before and in courts, decisions were made, and then laws were ultimately passed to protect these particular groups of individuals and people or institutions. So this leads us to our next topic of uh, adverse impact. All right. So adverse impact. Uh, a four-step process to determining adverse impact uh, presented here by the SHRM side of human resource management. Uh, calculate the rate of selection of each group. Two, determine which group has the highest selection rate. Three, calculate the impact ratios by comparing the selection rate for each group with that of the highest group or the majority. Observe whether, four, observe whether the selection rate for any group is substantially less, that is usually less than four-fifths or 80% than the selection rate of the highest group. Again, that's that four-fifths rule that we mentioned earlier. Let's look at some of their examples to sort of hopefully uh, solidify this idea. So we have the EEO group, we have Caucasian and Latino. There are 80 Caucasian applicants or white applicants and there were 40 Latino applicants. Of the 80 uh, Caucasians, 48 were hired. Of the 40 uh, Latino applicants, 12 were hired. 
Then we look over here at the selection rate. So we have 48 over 80 or 60%, 12 over 40 or 30%. A comparison of the Latino selection rate, 30%, with the Caucasian selection rate, 60%, shows that the Latino rate is 30 over 60 or half, 50% of the Caucasian rate. Because one half or 50% is less than four fifths or 80%, adverse impact is usually indicated here. A couple other examples, looking at the impact ratio for hiring. So again, we have the EEO groups of African-American, Latino, and Caucasian. We have the applicants for African-American, 108, Latino, 78, Caucasian, 325. The African American hired was 25, the Latino hired 24, Caucasian hired 114. So the percent hired is 23 African American, 31% Latino, and 35%, I mean 35% Caucasian. The group with the highest selection rate is Caucasian with 35%. Next, calculate the impact ratio. So the impact ratio here we see for African American, 23 over the 23 over the 35, that's the percent hired, over 35, which is the percent hired for the majority group Caucasian, and that's 66% impact ratio. For Latino, it's 31 over 35, or 89%, okay, impact ratio. So what we have here for African Americans, we have adverse impact, yes, because 66% is less than 80%. For Latino, 89%. There is no adverse impact because it is more than 80%. Here's some examples that we have from our uh, notes earlier. Again, the question that's being asked here, uh, does the requirement have adverse impact on the members of a protected class? Again, it occurs when the selection rate for one group is less than 80% of the rate for the highest scoring group. So here we have the number of applicants Please note that the columns and the rows have been reversed here in this example. So we have the number of male applicants, 50. Uh, number of female applicants, 30. Number of male, male applicants hired, 20. Number of female applicants hired, 10. For selection ratio of 0 0.40 for males, 0.33 for females. So 0.33 over 0 0.40 gives us 0.83, which is greater than the four-fifths rule or the 80% rule. So that gives us no adverse impact in this example. Example number two, looking at males and females again. So we have 40 male applicants, 20 were hired, uh, 20 female applicants and four were hired. The male selection ratio was 0.5. The female selection ratio was 0 0.2. 0 0.2 over 0.5 gives us 0.4, which is less than 0.80, so we have adverse impact indicated here. So let's look at how important this actually is. And because it is an important idea, uh, something to try to avoid either uh, intentional uh, discrimination or uh, inadvertent uh, unintentional discrimination. Uh, there are seven steps here that uh, Aon and Power Results suggest to minimize adverse impact. And again, some of this stuff should sound familiar to us because we've talked about them in one way or another already. Uh, and that is conduct a thorough job analysis, undertake uh, a validation study to make sure that you are measuring what you intend to be measuring, use valid and defensible assessments so you can defend them uh, if you ever wind up in a legal situation that you can defend them and you have the research data to back it up. Ensure your testing process is consistently fair. Broaden your recruitment strategy to include different groups. Standardize your job interviews and assessment centers. We talked about this several times already, how important it is to have a standardized job interview process and then constantly seek improvement, so continuous improvement. So these ideas really will help to uh, lessen the possibility of adverse impact if you follow them uh, religiously as an organization, as an employer, or, or as an IO professional or human resource professional. Now earlier when we went through the 
the graph uh, for the chart decision tree for is something legal or not. We talked about the idea of subterfuge for intentional discrimination. And we have a lot of, uh, of types of things there that could be hiding discriminatory type of behavior. Uh, we talked about it from the political area, uh, old voting requirements. Uh, again, that was one way to try to discriminate against people by uh, saying you had to uh, own property or you had to be literate, uh, be able to read and write. Uh, we also have residency requirements. I uh, have to live in a certain area to vote here. Uh, and those types of things as well. Height requirements. Again, you can have requirements that do not fit, uh, let's say, most females, for example. And if you have that as a requirement, uh, and very few females would fit that particular height requirement or some other physical type of requirement, uh, it could just be a smokescreen to discriminate against females. And so uh, we always are looking to make sure that whatever processes and criteria we have in place, that it is not some subterfuge for trying to uh, intentionally discriminate. Uh, and that's bad. I mean, you can unintentionally discriminate, but if you're doing it intentionally, uh, that's particularly bad. And that is why oftentimes when there is intentional discrimination found within an organization, uh, we see those punitive damages uh, tend to be really, really high. So can the employer prove that a requirement is exempt or job related? That is one of the things that is of great importance uh, to an organization dealing again with that uh, notion of the thorough job analysis and having all the validation studies and things of that nature showing and demonstrating that certain uh, requirements are indeed job related. So here are some of the things that we, we sort of need to understand. Uh, can the employer prove that the requirement is exempt or job related? First, let's talk about some of the exemptions. Uh, we have a bona fide seniority system. An organization that has a long-standing policy of promoting employees uh, with the greatest seniority or laying off employees with the least seniority can continue to do so even though adverse impact occurs. So seniority system trumps adverse impact. Then we have veterans' preference rights. Most civil service jobs provide extra points on tests for veterans of the armed forces. For example, in Fort Worth, Texas, veterans who apply for city jobs get five points added to their exam score. Because most people in the military are male, awarding these extra points for military service results in adverse impact against females. Okay, but however, according to the Civil Rights Act of 1964, such practices by public agencies are exempt from legal action as long as the veteran's preference is the result of a government regulation. Okay, and then we have another exemption, national security. In certain circumstances, it is legal, it is legal for an employer to discriminate against a member of a particular national origin or other protected class when it is in the best interest of the nation's security to do so. As an example, uh, for years, Russian citizens living in the United States were prohibited from working in any defense-related industry. Now, the job-related. So we're talking about those groups that are exempt. Now let's look at job-related. Can the employer prove that a requirement is job-related? Okay, so we have such things as proving that the BFOQ, the bona fide occupational qualification, is legitimate. We need to have make sure there are valid testing procedures. Valid, again, being that you are measuring something that is tied to the job that this test or this procedure does access. We have certain methods that can be employed of content validity, criterion validity, and validity generalization. Let's look at some of those now. So content validity uh, is based on a solid job analysis, a method of rationally matching tasks with the necessary knowledge, skills, and abilities, and other characteristics to perform the job. So with uh, solid job analysis, you can tie this, the key tasks of this job 
to things which are necessary for the job to get done by way of knowledge, skills, abilities, and so on. So this is going to be the case that an organization would make to protect itself against possible issues uh, in the legal arena. Then we have criterion validity. Correlate test scores with relevant criteria. We have concurrent and predictive okay, requirements, reasonable sample size, good range of tests and criterion scores, and a good standard, good criterion. Uh, just to specify, make sure we got a uh, good understanding here. Concurrent validity is a form of criterion validity that correlates test scores with measures of job performance for employees currently working for an organization. Of course, we've talked about previously some issues with doing those particular type of concurrent validity studies because sometimes you learn things that a new employee may not learn or know uh, before they are hired. Uh, that you learn on the job when you're at that organization, but concurrent validity is tying it to the performance of current employees. Predictive validity, uh, on the other hand, uh, is a criterion validity in which test scores of applicants are compared at a later date with measures of job performance. But this is going to have some, some of its own issues, one of them being is that it is very unlikely that when you're doing a predictive uh, validity study that you're going to hire everybody because that's the best way to, to be able to predict that means the people who are going to be low performers and the people who are going to be the high performers you can predict who's going to be who but it's very unlikely that the pe people who would be the really really low performers would have been hired in the first place most organizations will not want to take that chance then we have validity generalization based on such things as a meta-analysis it borrows validity from other studies or organizations, and job analysis results must be similar. So the idea here is that you can generalize to other organizations, for example, if the job analysis results are similar, you might be able to do this. You can borrow validity studies from other studies in other organizations, maybe of a similar size, of a similar type of industry. Uh, but again, this is some of the things that uh, you need to have the data for uh, just in case you do wind up in a late situation, you have all this information backing your organization up. And another item that was uh, mentioned in the flow chart that we saw, the decision tree chart we saw earlier, did the employer look for a reasonable alternative with less adverse impact? So if there is adverse impact, did they at least attempt to try to find something that would have less? A different test measuring the same construct. Again, uh, having knowledge of the types of tests that are out there that can do the similar types of things that this test that you were employing that seems to have a little bit of adverse impact associated with it, that would be something that an organization could do. Uh, so use a totally different type of test altogether. Uh, changes to the testing conditions. Uh, see if it's video rather than written. Uh, employ practice exams or other conditioning programs or redesign the job itself so that those issues that could have some sort of adverse impact are going to be less pertinent. Again, only if it makes sense for the job. Jobs can be redesigned to make them uh, more efficient and more effective. It's going to be up to the organization and what they want to do in order to try to uh, handle and address potential issues with adverse impact. Next topic we want to cover is harassment. Now, obviously, harassment is something that uh, most people have some familiarity with. Uh, again, think about examples of harassment that you may have seen uh, in the workplace. Uh, it is something that can be, uh, is very problematic uh, at every level of, of an organization and many diverse types of organizations as well. Now, EEOC complaints in 2013, 21,371 charges of harassment, 7,256 were for sexual harassment, charges of sexual harassment, 17.6% of the charges were made by males. Harassment charges, 40% racial, 34% sexual, and 26% other protected classes. Again, we see uh, the protected classes thing again because they seem to be the ones who are most often going to be targeted.
potential victims of harassment, uh, we have gender, race, religion, age, national origin, your alien status or citizenship status, disability, as well as sexual preference. The types of harassment, quid pro quo, and hostile environment. Quid pro quo harassment claims. Granting of sexual favors is tied to employment decisions. A single incident is enough. So one thing, one event, one incident could be enough to have grounds for a sexual harassment. The organization is always liable. That is why you see so often the sexual harassment seminars uh, given usually every year by organizations of any size because it is a, a, a thing which has potential legal ramifications uh, for organizations which are quite uh, substantial. Then we have hostile environment harassment claims. Here we look at a pattern of conduct. Uh, it usually is going to be related to gender. Uh, it is unwanted, is negative to the reasonable person. It affects a term, condition, or privilege of employment. Behaviors that could be sexual harassment, sexual comments, undue attention, verbal sexual abuse, verbal sexual displays, body language, invitations, physical advances, and explicit sexual invitations. Types of harassing behavior, comments, jokes, posters, cartoons, email, drawings. Now, what does it mean when you have a behavior that are uh, offensive? Behaviors are offensive if they perpetuate stereotypes, degrade another group, build up own group, make others feel uncomfortable. What causes offensive behavior? Hatred toward a group to express an emotion, anger, or frustration. Ignorance. Attempts to gain power and to fit in with another group. Well, why is harassment a problem? Well, it's obvious, but here are some of the, what the data tells us. It hurts workplace relationships. Uh, a strained environment in the work in, workplace is a really uncomfortable one. It causes emotional distress, and that emotional distress can also lead to physical distress as well. When those things are at play in a work environment, it will decrease productivity. People tend to want to leave or stay away from these particular environments. Therefore, it increases turnover as well as absenteeism. And of course, uh, more importantly to the bottom line anyway, it increases legal liability. Having organizations, departments that are somewhat toxic uh, to the uh, course of doing good work and having a positive atmosphere can be a major liability for an organization. Discouraging harassment. Uh, just some suggestions here. You don't laugh at offensive behavior. You do speak your mind and let employees know when they are crossing the line. What to do if you think you are being harassed? Talk to the individual. Yellow light, red light, the idea of you know, giving them the yellow light warning or red light if it's particularly bad. But again, if it's really atrocious, you need to go seek some uh, support immediately. Talk to your supervisor or to the HR director. All complaints are taken seriously. An investigation will occur. 
Think about what you want the outcome to be and don't publicize your complaint. Uh, and it should be noted that they do take these things very, very seriously. Any type of harassment complaint uh, can uh, occur at any level. And when it is taken to the supervisor or HR director, they will take it very, very seriously, or at least they're supposed to. Uh, it's a very serious threat to the, the goodwill of the organization in the workplace, as well as having a great deal of legal liability. So what is responding to a complaint? Well, we have the following, the liability of the organization. Victims must be encouraged to come forward. Okay, not to hide it, not to put it away in the closet, but to come forward. Every complaint or suspicion must be, must be investigated. And if it's not, it will be really, really bad in the long run for the organization, uh, particularly if it goes to some sort of uh, more thorough investigation uh, from an external agency and then a lawsuit. Uh, when, if it's found to have ignored what was in front of it, in front of its eyes, uh, then it can be uh, a very dangerous situation for liability to the organization. Also, appropriate action must follow the investigation. You must do something with it. You cannot just let it sit there. The investigation must be done, and then some action must be taken. Investigating complaints must be prompt. Complaints must be kept confidential to protect the accused. Now, again, this is something, too, that you need to highlight as well. You have somebody who accuses someone else, but until there is any evidence of anything, uh, that person who has been accused their rights must be protected as well. So investigation must be prompt. The complaints must be kept confidential to protect the accused. Actions must be taken to protect the accuser during the investigation. There needs to be some sort of due process. Normally that due process is written out in the handbook or the policies and regulations of the organization. And then the appropriate action must be taken. Now at, at times, depending on what the circumstances are, usually it may involve removing someone from a certain role or position uh, temporarily, again, in order to protect uh, the, the, the individuals that are involved in this, uh, in this particular incident. So those are some of the things that the organization uh, must do and make sure that it maintains. Now, just to wrap up a couple of other ideas, we've talked about uh, harassment here. We've talked about some of the other issues. Uh, another or a type of thing that goes on in organizations when it comes to selection is about affirmative action. Uh, well, what is affirmative action? Uh, is it a good idea? Uh, the notion here is that affirmative action is uh, strategies that organizations uh, may employ in order to ensure uh, a diverse workplace uh, as well as uh, ensure that uh, they are enhancing their organization uh, by doing so. Uh, affirmative action strategies, we have intentional recruitment of minority applicants, removal of supervisor and employee prejudices, so that can involve things like training, identification and removal of employment practices that work against minority employment, excuse me, employees. That could be such things as uh, adverse impact if you're talking about selecting minority employees uh, and saying that the proper training uh, and support are given to minorities, uh, females and other minorities in order to ensure that they have the same opportunities as others. And then of course one that we see most often which is somewhat controversial for many is preferential hiring and promotion of minorities. Again it should be emphasized when they talk about preferential hiring and promotion of minorities they are saying of equally or better qualified individuals uh, who happen to be uh, 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 minorities, they will get the uh, leg up, so to speak, uh, when you are against a majority and a minority. If they are of equal background, equal capability, then of course, uh, if you have a, a affirmative action strategy in place, then preferential hiring or promotion may go to that minority. Well, why is it that we see organizations uh, have affirmative action plans? Uh, first, it could be involuntary, which means that there is a government regulation to which this organization falls under that requires them to have it. Or the organization 
uh, because of a case, a, a legal case proceeding and a decision by the court. Uh, maybe they were doing something dealing with discriminatory practices or situations, and they were ordered by the court to institute uh, and implement an affirmative action plan. Or they could be voluntary, okay, that someone decrees that we want to do this uh, and also a desire to be a good citizen. It helps with community relations, customer relations, and hope that diversity will increase productivity uh, with the organization and with the marketplace. So, why do we have potentially a, a affirmative action plan? Uh, was there a history of discrimination? No. Okay. Uh, then plan is illegal, so we don't need to have one. Uh, if there is a history of discrimination, yes. Does the plan only benefit actual victims of discrimination? Yes, the plan is legal. No. What population was used to establish the goals? Uh, plan is illegal if it's not something they did for. They need to be looking for the right population to establish these. Qualified workforce. The plan uh, trammel the rights of non-minorities. Yes, if it does that, the plan is illegal. No. Is there an ending point to the plan? Yes, the plan is legal. So what this highlights is that there is an end point to an affirmative action plan. Okay, they're trying to get to a point uh, that sort of helps the organization sort of codify and institutionalize certain types of behaviors uh, so that the organization probably will be in the future a more diverse one. So legality of preferential hiring, was there a history of discrimination? A history of discrimination must be demonstrated. Uh, numeric disparity can, be, can establish history. Numeric disparity by itself may not be enough to uh, have a legality of preferential hiring. Affirmative action posture and efforts will also be considered. Other reasons such as lack of interest in the position must be considered along with the disparity, meaning that sometimes you may not get certain people for a particular job because they really truly are not interested in a particular position. So legality of preferential hiring, what is population was used to establish the hiring or, pro or promotion goals? We must take into consideration the area population. Uh, in your particular area where your organization is, do you have the types of individuals under consideration here? Do you have the types of individual of those types with the qualifications? Okay, so your area may be problematic as well. You don't, don't have certain types of individuals within the area population. Uh, qualified workforce. Uh, we see a variety of things. There could be minimum standards, uh, minority interest in occupation. These things must be thought of as well because they do play a role in the interest of potential candidates for a position in your organization. Uh, they can use census data, uh, and other types of things to try to determine uh, what you have in your particular region or area of your organization. So we don't want to look at this totally in total isolation. We must look at the sort of theater of operation for a particular business or organization to see what do they have available by way of workers. Legality of preferential hiring did the plan trammel the rights of non-minorities. Uh, the magnitude of the goal must be reasonable, okay? All people hired must be qualified. Race, gender can be used to break ties among equally qualified applicants. And promotion spots can be double-filled. Legality of preferential hiring, is there an ending point to the plan? Progress must be periodically reviewed. The plan must end when goals have been achieved. The consequences of affirmative action programs. People hire due to affirmative action. Well, they can be perceived by coworkers as being less competent. They tend to devalue their own performance. 
and they may behave negatively toward other affirmative action people. Organizations using AA-based hiring have lower levels, lower levels of productivity according to some research. So again, it is a process and plans that are in place not for permanency but for temporary to achieve certain goals and so there is an end point. Uh, but obviously it is something that has been controversial but if it is done as it's described and laid out normally there isn't too much of a problem with it. So is preferential hiring a promotion uh, in the promotion a good idea? Well probably under some circumstances You'd probably make the case for both sides, but again, it is something to think about at least. The Americans with Disability Act (ADA) and 2008 ADA uh, Amendments Act organizations must make reasonable accommodation for the physically or mentally disabled, unless to do so would impose an undue hardship. And that is a lot of uh, sort of discussions there as to what is a reasonable accommodation. But again, uh, we see that putting in a ramp, which these days is sort of a like standard operating procedure for ease of access for people who are disabled, who have, who have wheelchairs, for example. But anything that is reasonable, that's not gonna break the bank of the organization, probably would need to be considered for someone who is applying for a position. Uh, so, People with disabilities, they need to have the fair chance as well uh, in order to attain a position if they are capable of doing the job with reasonable accommodation. So think about it too. Uh, maybe you yourself may be disabled or you know co-workers who are disabled. Just what experiences have you had with them? Uh, just think about what they may be from their perspective as well. So what do we mean by disability? Uh, the definition of disability, a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities. Also a record of such impairment or being regarded as having such an impairment. And again, the idea of reasonable accommodations, what are they? Well, reasonable accommodations making facilities accessible, restructuring jobs, reassignment of a vacant position, modifying work schedules, acquisition or modification of equipment or devices, providing readers or interpreters, changing examinations, training materials, or policies. Now, part of this is also making sure that things which are essential to the job can be done. So ways to determine if a job function is essential. Well, first we have the employer's judgment. We have, of course, our friend, the written job description based on that job analysis. The amount of time spent performing the function. Consequences of not requiring the incumbent to perform the function. And work experience of past job incumbents. Medical exams and inquiries. Pre-hire medical exams and inquiries are prohibited. You cannot ask such questions. You cannot ask them to go through certain examinations. Applicants may be asked if they are able to perform essential job-related functions. That's it. Medical exams occur after a conditional offer of employment. Some clarifications. The act does not require an organization to hire the disabled. The act does not require an organization to give preference to the disabled. The act requires that the disabled be given an equal opportunity and if the best qualified to be given the job. Okay, summary of some key legislation. We have the Civil Rights Act of 1964 prohibited discrimination and offered a bunch of protected classes. We have the Uniform Guidelines of Employee Selection, where we have mentioned such things as adverse impact in the four-fifths rule. 
the Americans with Disabilities Act, which we just covered some of those types of things, essential functions and reasonable accommodations being two key points there. Some additional legal issues dealing with affirmative action addresses part discrimination, uh, may range from targeted recruitment to preferential treatment, does not include quotas or, or hiring people who do not meet qualifications. And that's what we normally hear as a major issue with it, but the firm of action has nothing to do with that. It does not include quotas or hiring people who do not meet qualifications. It required of all organizations with fewer, uh, with greater than 50, uh, employees or government contractors with greater than $50,000 or for companies with a history of discrimination and can be viewed as fair when used properly. And discrimination laws similar outside of the US, the emphasis depends on the national history. And that's what it comes down to a great deal is historically uh, in any nation around the globe, there have been groups that have gotten the short end of the stick, so to speak. And usually when they are protecting groups and establishing laws, they are trying to correct, I guess in a way, sins of the past because those things can become somewhat institutionalized and we try to break that by having certain laws in place to protect certain groups as well as affirmative action to, to do something proactively to try to address it as well. And finally, we want to talk about some privacy issues. We're just going to touch on this really lightly here, but privacy issues, as I sort of alluded to earlier, it's a very important topic in today's world. Uh, what privacy do you have? I mean, now with more and more people working from home, uh, it may not be as pertinent, but where does the business own, do they have some say about searching your computer files that you use at home? Who knows? But these are things that may pop up more and more as as the world changes and adjusts to certain circumstances. But here are some privacy issues that we normally see. Dealing with drug testing, office and locker searches, psychological tests, for example, the results from psychological tests. Should, if someone takes a MMPI, does the organization have the right to look at them uh, with, without regard to how they were being used for initially, for example, for selection procedures. Can they look at them for some other cause or other reason, as well as electronic surveillance? Uh, organizations have the ability these days to monitor just about everything you do uh, when you're at work on your computer. Every keystroke, they could monitor you using webcams. So the idea that they could do things in, in this particular day and age, but do they and should they have the right to? And obviously we'll probably see more and more of these things pop up in, in courts in the future as organizations do what they think is well within their purview, uh, but the employee may not think so. So these are privacy rights and privacy issues that will have to be considered. So focus on ethics and workplace privacy. Uh, some things to think about as we wrap it up here. Do you think the legal reasons for these workplace practices outweigh the ethical responsibilities of organizations? Are companies being unfair and therefore unethical by engaging in such activities? What are the ethical responsibilities to employees from companies who choose to use such practices? What are some of the ethical dilemmas that you think could arise from such practices and conduct an internet search on the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act. Do you think that that act is fair to employers and employees? Why or why not? So the idea here is that we have a lot of things available to us as organizations and employers uh, and we could do many things. What should be the limits? What is and what does it mean to have workplace privacy? All right, that's it for now.